All right, so I'll go ahead and kick us off um, while people continue to get logged in. Um, so again, um, thank you so much everyone for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Kate Schwanhauser and I am the special events manager here at Food and Water Watch. Um, some of you are familiar with my face at this point after joining a couple of our monthly events this year. And it's good to see some familiar names um, here in attendance tonight. So thank you all for joining us um, and welcome to those of you who are new. Um, so our event tonight is Voices of the Future, and we have an incredible film screening, um, as well as a conversation with the talented filmmakers behind those films for you later this evening. Um, but before we dive into that, I just want to go over a couple of Zoom um, tips for everybody. Um, so again, the chat box is live, um, so please feel free to use that um, throughout the event as we're watching the films to share your thoughts and reactions. Let us know what inspires you about them. Um, and I see lots of people already testing it out and sharing where they're coming um, from this evening. So that's awesome to see people from all across the US. Um, after we watch the three films, we'll have a discussion with the filmmakers. So you can use the Q&A button that you see on the toolbar on your screen to ask any questions that you'd like them to answer. So you'll just click on that and type your questions in there and we'll ask those during the Q&A portion. And um, finally, we're recording this event, so we'll share that later with everyone so that you can go back and rewatch anything or share that link out with any of your friends and family. Um, so many of you here tonight are members of Food and Water Watch, and Food and Water Watch works to mobilize people and communities to build political power so that we can fight for the solutions that we need to protect our climate, our food, and our water. And it's your support as members that allows our organizers to work in communities across the country and at the national level to fight for bans against factory farms, to keep our water clean and affordable, and to fight against the fossil fuel industry to protect our climate. So thank you all so much. It's your membership and your support that makes all of this work possible. Um, and many of you probably know that this event is part of our monthly member event series. And hosting these events is a way for us to bring you discussions on pressing issues or opportunities to hear from inspiring speakers like our guests tonight. And it's just one way for us to say thank you. Um, and our winter lineup is available online for you to sign up for. Um, so next month on December 8th, we'll be talking about some soon to be released um, research documenting the impacts of power plants on nearby communities. And we'll hear from organizers and volunteers who are working on the ground as part of some critical campaigns in New York and California. Um, and then we'll start off in January with an event on the 19th discussing climate anxiety, um, which is something I'm sure that you're all familiar with, um, and strategies for not letting it overwhelm you so that we can keep up these important fights to protect our climate. You may have signed up for some of these when you signed up for tonight's event, but if not, I encourage you to, um, to join us. So we'll put a link in the chat um, where you can RSVP for those now. All right, so let's um, go ahead and get started. Um, so first, um, we're excited to be hosting this event in partnership with the One Earth Film Festival's Young Filmmakers Contest. And the three films that you're going to see tonight were part of the 2021 contest and they talk about some really important issues from food security to environmental justice to protecting our pollinators. And before we hit play, um, I want to introduce you all to Sue Crothers, who is the founding director of the Young Filmmakers Contest. Um, so Sue, I'm so glad that you are here with us um, this evening. And I'd like to invite you on screen just to share a few words with everybody about the Young Filmmakers Contest. Thank you so much, Kate, and welcome everybody. Um, again, Sue Crothers, I am the founding director of the One Earth um, Young Filmmakers Contest. And the One Earth Young Filmmakers Contest is part of the One Earth Film Festival, which is a program run by an organization called the One Earth Collective in Oak Park, Illinois. And the festival is hosted the first weekend of March every year. And the festival screens approximately 25 to 30 environmental films throughout the city of Chicago suburbs and neighboring areas. And of course, like everybody else, we pivoted very quickly and successfully, I might add, um, to virtual uh, these last two years. And um, that actually expanded our reach. 
And um, we expect in March 22 that it'll be somewhat of a, a hybrid. So for those of you who are from outside Illinois, you can join us online in March 22 for our next festival. And the mission of the Young Filmmakers Contest portion of the festival is to elevate the voices of youth through the creative medium of film. So we are steadfast in our belief that we cannot achieve climate justice without including the generation that is directly impacted by the environmental mismanagement of the generations before them. So we activate the youth to address the impacts and equities and environmental issues uh, to offer solutions and create awareness and inspire change through film. So the Young Filmmakers Contest receives submissions from across the country um, and we offer prizes from grades three through to post-grad um, for, for environmental films three to eight minutes long and 45 second and above animations. And we don't just award prizes, we're a believer in creating action. So each film receives a matching grant to a nonprofit environmental organization of the filmmaker's choice that is working on the subject matter of their film. So we make that connection. Um, and as you will see by the films tonight, these young filmmakers address very sophisticated subjects surrounding the climate crisis. They bring depth to the conversation and a call to action to demand and create meaningful change. So if you like what you see here tonight, I encourage you to visit the 10 Film Festival website where you can see all of our winning films both this year and in past years. So thanks again, Kate, for inviting us. Uh, thank you to Food and Water Watch for elevating these films and these young activists. Thanks so much, Sue. Um, we're so glad to be partnering with you on this. And we did just put a link in the chat to um, the festival website. So be sure that you check that out and we'll share it um, in an email um, follow-up after this event too, so that you can see some of the other films um, that have been part of this incredible contest. Um, all right, so now I'm going to invite my colleague Jessica Gable to our virtual stage here. Um, she's going to be moderating the discussion with our filmmakers after we watch their films. Um, so thank you for being here tonight, Jessica. Of um, course. And I'm actually going to turn things over to you now if you would introduce um, each of our films and I'll go ahead and, and cue those up to start playing them. Sure, absolutely. I'm really happy to be here with you all. So as a reminder, as you watch the films, please go ahead and put any reactions that you have in the chat. And if you have any questions for our filmmakers, please pop those into the Q&A box. And I will bring those up in our moderated discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. So first up, we have As We Are Planted, made by Anna Lee Ackerman. Oh, I see no aprons and gloves. They're in this kit, they're right here. All right, how we coming? You don't have to ball them up. All you gotta do is open it up, fill up your gold, fill up your gold, fill up your gold. Thank you. Thank you. How we coming over here, team? How we doing? The food pantry was started by two nuns in the early 70s as a need, they saw a need for people who needed food. Was the client. And I had gone through many hard times. And then I came here and, and desperate, being, being desperate in whatever I was going through in life. And they asked me to volunteer. And so as my life was getting better, I was volunteering here. And they believed in me enough, more than I believed in myself to be employed here. It's my opportunity, like I said, to give back. It means a lot to me because I know they helped save my life, really. And they helped me. They were a support system for me as I was going through my trials. Why are people here today? 
food? Yes. And what is the reasons that people need food? What are some reasons people need food? Uh, so they don't starve. Yeah. And, but what did you notice we gave out mostly today? Uh, veggies. Okay, produce. We're in what is known as a food desert. Do you know what a food desert is? Yes. A place full of food where you uh, give it to people? Well, you're almost there. It's a place where people can't get enough food, except especially fresh produce, because grocery stores are so far apart from each other. We ask our clients what would the food state would like, and fresh produce goes to the top of the list. So we partner with Just Roots, and they have freshly grown produce. And we know that it's, that's the best item that we could give our client. In 2016, my good friend Sabrina and I talked about, you know, what if we started a farm in the city and use that as a platform to grow food for the local community, provide educational programming to, to empower people with skills to grow their own food and build community in the process. I've always been really lucky and very privileged to have access to healthy, affordable food. I understand that, that when I'm talking with people about food, like I have to really learn to listen and be understanding of their situation. Yeah. Of course, building more grocery stores would be one of the answers. It always irks me to see in the poorest neighborhoods, the highest prices. It just is so defeating. There are close to, I think, 20,000 vacant lots in the city of Chicago that are just being used for nothing right now. If we can use those spaces in a really great way that hopefully helps to change health outcomes in a community, why not use that land for something really purposeful as opposed to just letting it sit vacant? We are right now looking at a space that we are considering to um, partner with St. James and the Archdiocese. We want them to consider allowing us to use this land to do our farming. So if everything works out, we'll be here next 2020. We could have a garden here, which we see would help not just us, but the community. It would be participation with some of the clients. Uh, some of the community would participate, hopefully, in that program yes. of the earning. Oh, everything in my kitchen is red because I cook with love. And that's what that means to me. Nobody would believe how much red. I just got to show you. See all of that? The meal is nice, but you know, everybody can't have the meal. So if you didn't have the meal, Thanksgiving still has to be about something. Before we even eat, we all have to go around the, the table and say 10 things we're grateful for. We just usually forget those 10 things. We, we take it for granted. And I have my apartment. I was on the street. I've come from the street to this. I am very grateful and thankful. I have had many clients come crying for a lot of things, but they go out crying tears of joy. And we can just make things better, just for that, even if it's for that minute. It took me a long time to realize in my heart, I can't fix it, I can't end all the hunger. But I can smile, I can listen. I'm where I think, I, I know, I'm where I know God wants me to be. Our philosophy at the food pantry is empowerment. So it's about helping not only clients, but volunteers, staff like I, to grow, to go to a better place. I want every person to be able to have access to healthy foods, right? Like this is a really holistic process where people are not just being fed good food that's good for them, but their, their minds and their hearts are being fed as well. It's not just about feeding and stopping you from starving. It's about feeding your soul, feeding your emotions, feeding you in so many ways. It is more than food. It's just more than food.
Oh my gosh, I love that story. I can't wait to hear more from Anna Lee. Um, I tear up every time I see that. So um, as we queue up our next film, if you do have any questions that you would like me to pose to Anna Lee in the um, Q&A section, then please use the Q&A box and I'll be happy to ask those. Um, our next film is Saving Colorado Solitary Bees by Carly Wetherill and Mackenzie Cleflin. Save the Bees. If you've been paying attention to the news and social media at all in the past few years, this phrase may sound familiar to you. Now, this is for a reason. Saving the Bees isn't some fad, trend, or challenge. The decline in bee populations across North America is a pressing ecological problem. Now, what can you personally do to help a global issue? The answer is simple. Start small. We believe that changing the world starts in your community. Think about it. If everyone worked toward improving their community, they would, in turn, make the world a better place. Hi, my name is Carly. And my name is Kenzie. And our capstone and passion project is to save our local solitary bees. In this video, we will be teaching you more about what a solitary bee actually is and how you can help save them. In case you didn't already know, bees are the number one pollinator, and humans rely on them heavily to pollinate crops that feed the world. With this in mind, it is in mankind's best interest to do all we can to make sure that bees don't disappear. Unfortunately, bee populations are on the decline, especially in Europe and the United States. Clearly, the Earth's super pollinators are in danger. What could be threatening our fur yellow friends? The biggest dangers to bee populations are habitat and wildflower loss, disease causing viruses, parasitic mites, and neonicotinoids. Wild native bees are especially susceptible to these mites and viruses. Now, Carly, what is a solitary bee? So glad you asked. Solitary bees are bees that do not live in a hive, produce honey, or have a queen. Instead, each individual female makes a single cell nest and holes in the ground, wood, or anywhere really. There are 950 species of solitary bees in Colorado, including sweat bees, leafcutter bees, longhorned bees, mason bees, and small carpenter bees. The way that solitary bees nest is very unique. After the bee locates a hole to build their nest in, they begin to build a pollen ball where their egg will be laid and their larvae will hatch. The pollen serves as a cocoon as well as food for the larvae. The bee then builds a thin wall and lays yet another egg until the entire hole is filled. Then she seals it off for safekeeping. The larvae will spend the winter growing in the nest and emerge in the spring or summer. Now that we know more about these amazing bees, what can we do to increase our local population? Well, there are a few ways to do this. We will touch on each of these methods, starting with wildflowers. As previously mentioned, habitat loss poses a threat to Colorado's native bees. Solitary bees rely on the nectar and pollen from blooming plants in the area. Planting wildflowers helps to enrich the community as well as help the bees. 
Additionally, if you trim your plants like we do, the hollow stems are ideal places for solitary bees to nest. You can't go wrong with these native Colorado blooms. Believe it or not, planting flowers isn't the only way to provide nesting holes for solitary bees. Leaf cutter and mason bees love to nest in what are called bee hotels. These can easily be made at home. Here's how we made our own DIY bee hotel. If you're wanting to build a bee hotel for your garden, the first thing that you'll want to do is come up with a design. We recommend keeping it small to prevent the spread of disease and parasitic mites between the solitary bees that choose to nest in your hotel. To achieve our desired shape, we cut even sections of wood and made angled cuts on the end with a power saw. Using painter's tape, a vise, and a nail gun, we formed three hexagons and nailed them together. The recommended depth of a bee hotel is 6 inches. Next, a roof is a good addition to the hotel to shield nests from the elements, as is some sort of backing. Now that you have your frame, determine how you will provide the bees with a nesting hole. We recommend hole diameters between 6 and 8 millimeters. Our tubes were purchased online and were made specifically for bee hotels, but you can easily make your own by rolling paper or cardboard. You can secure your tubes with a rubber band and fit them snugly in your frame with natural materials from your area. Though not necessary, chicken wire may be a smart addition to your hotel to prevent uninvited visitors such as birds and squirrels. Lastly, secure your bee hotel with a sturdy method such as screws and hose clamps. Though not necessarily picky, bees will be less likely to nest in a hotel that is hanging and swinging in the wind. You will want to place your bee hotel facing southeast for a maximum amount of morning sunlight. Bees are ectothermic and use sunlight for energy to start foraging. Speaking of foraging, don't forget to plant lots of colorful, native flowering plants around your hotel. Bees especially love blue, purple, yellow, and white flowers where pollen is easily accessible. Remember, bees may not nest in your hotel right away. It may take a season or two before they take to it. Nonetheless, building bee hotels is a fantastic method to promote solitary bee nesting in your area. The last method is simply raising awareness. Knowledge is power. Take this new knowledge and use it to empower others to make a difference in your community. This can be as simple as sharing a post on social media to building a bee hotel and showing it to others. Together, we can make Canyon City a beautiful place. That's amazing. I definitely want to make a bee hotel in my own backyard. Um, and if you have any more questions, we already have a few in the Q&A box. So if you have any more questions for Carly and Mackenzie, please pop them into that Q&A box and we will have time for those questions in just a bit. Our final film is by Ilan Hinich titled Fighting for Environmental Justice, the Health Crisis at the US-Mexico Border. The San Ysidro Port of Entry in Southern California is the busiest land border crossing in the Western Hemisphere. Last year, according to the U.S. Bureau of Transportation, roughly 14.9 million vehicles, as well as 1.6 billion worth of goods, cross back and forth every day. However, the residents of San Ysidro, which is 93% Hispanic, have not felt the economic boom. The region is home to almost 70,000 people who live below the federal poverty level. Per the San Ysidro School District, nearly one in three students are homeless. Many residents are also worried about the port of entry's impact on their health. Crossing vehicles sit in traffic for up to two or three hours, idling exhaust into the immediate area. 
children are forced to breathe this polluted air, which studies have directly linked to childhood respiratory issues. So idling is when a vehicle is stopped. It's the motor's running, but it's stopped. It gives out higher emissions than as if it were running on the freeway because the temperature on the motor is, is higher. There's higher asthma rates in San Isidro. What do we do? The federal government has a border right in the middle of this community. Last year, a major expansion of the crossing was finally completed, which will increase vehicle traffic at an estimated 87% by 2030. So since the border expansion plan actually came out uh, back in the mid-2000s, um, the community had a lot of concern of what it would bring to San Isidro, um, air pollution-wise, uh, traffic-wise, different impacts. The federal government claims the expansion will present no negative health and safety risks to children. But despite this, residents are not convinced. For example, Miguel Cornejo, a local farm owner, can attest to the visible impact of air pollution. The visual evidence points towards a clear case of environmental injustice towards the residents of San Isidro. We're involved in projects in Tijuana that have air monitoring projects, and then also in San Isidro thinking about how the air quality is really, really horrible here, and we're in the top 25 census tracts for the state of California. Taking matters into their own hands, Casa Familiar recently obtained funding from Cal EPA to conduct their own air pollution study. Casa Familiar was one of the few key players in the room discussing environmental justice issues and bringing those to the table in general. Those weren't on the mind of people who were in the Department of Homeland Security. For now, Casa Familiar is focused on taking steps to mitigate the environmental damage on the community. This is the best moment now to act. So then you start installing, for example, this is like a dream, but like you start installing air quality and filtration systems in the schools so the kids don't have poor air, indoor air quality. You make sure that the kids don't go outside when there's a fire burning, because if you have asthma, that will exacerbate your asthma. Um, and so it's about connecting the environment to the health and wellness of the community, which is already the core mission of Casa Familiar. a powerful message. Now, for the moment you've all been waiting for, let's meet our filmmakers. So I am thrilled to be joined today by Anna Lee Ackerman, Mackenzie Claflin, Carly Wetherill, and Elon Hinnich. If you all can um, unmute yourselves and um, unmute your video, that would be lovely. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for using film to help us all learn about these important issues. All right, Anna Lee and Elon, there you are. Great to have everybody here. So um, we already have a lot of really good questions in the Q&A box and I have just a few questions for all of you first. Um, so whoever would like to go first, but um, what drew you to the topics that you discussed in your films? So if anybody wants to go ahead and jump in, please do, or I can just call on somebody. So Elon, we just saw your film, so why don't, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Yeah, so I was doing an internship at the University of San Diego in their Institute of Peace and Justice. And uh, the interns there do a lot of research topics like immigration or the envir env environmental justice or on the built environment. And I was focusing on the built environment. And I was while I was researching this topic, the uh, the organization of the organization of Casa Familiar came up and the issues they were facing. And this intrigued me because there was not a lot of information online on the issues at San Isidro, at the San Isidro community. So I was there that I decided to make a documentary and show people what was happening. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I think environmental justice is something that Food and Water Watch is heavily involved in. And most of our campaigns um, have an intersection there. So I think your film beautifully illustrates the connection between pollution and justice, climate justice for these frontline communities. Um, so Anna Lee, we've also had a lot of interest in the Q&A in your film. So what drew you to the food pantry and to um, Just Roots? 
Absolutely. So I made my film as part of a capstone project for my degree when I was studying documentary filmmaking in college. I just graduated in December. And part of that was um, for this class to just pick one topic to make a film about, and that was the entire class, which was great. And so when it came time to think of a project to do, I had volunteered at, at the farm once before um, with a previous job that, that I had, and I was so shocked to learn that there are urban farms in Chicago. I had lived in, in Chicago for, for, for school for a few years, and I'm from the suburbs here, and so I just had no idea that this was a thing. And, uh, and I learned also that a lot of people around me also didn't know. Um, and I just wanted to showcase their, the, amazing, um, the amazing work that, that they were doing. And through them, I was able to get connected with the food pantry um, to make it a very more, more so holistic piece. Um, and on a very personal note, in high school for a period of time, um, my, my family utilized a food pantry for a while when my mom lost her job. And so just all these different aspects of, of a little bit of a personal connection, but also the important work that they were doing that I wanted to showcase that made a perfect storm. No, thank you so much for sharing that, Annalie. And I love that you do have that personal connection to the story and to food justice. So we have environmental justice and then we have food justice. Um, such a great diversity of topics here to discuss. So for Carly and Mackenzie, we have a lot of questions in the Q&A about um, solitary bees, but I'll just get us started off with what drew you to the idea of solitary bees and um, educating people about them. So um, our high school, um, a lot like um, Anna's uh, college, we have to do a capstone project. Um, and this is fairly new for our school. Um, and it has to pose a solution to a problem in our community. And Carly and I, we both knew that we wanted um, to work on it together and that we wanted to make a short film um, with original music. And at the time we were both very interested in um, environmental science. And so um, I think it was Carly that found the article about bee hotels. And so we started to do some more um, research into bee hotels and what exactly they were about because we had never heard of a bee that nests in a, in a hole rather than in a hive. And so that's where we um, learned about solitary bees and that most of the population um, of Colorado's bees are solitary. And so we decided that we wanted to focus our, our project on that. Anything you wanna add, Carly? Yeah, that was great. That's exactly what I would have said. I think we just, um, we wanted to do, like find something that we could exactly like solve the problem for that we could do in our community since it's such a like a widespread problem. Like what can we actually do to um, like help the problem? So yeah, I think that you have already inspired a lot of curiosity in people. So um, I'm just gonna dive into the Q&A box. So we have, several questions on solitary bees. Um, one of them is, so are solitary bees the ones who pollinate our food crops? Um, yeah, so they, I can, oh, yeah, you take it. You take <laughs> sorry, it okay. okay, all right. So yeah, um, solitary bees are the ones that pollinate food crops. Honeybees also do that, but it just kind of like depends on what food and like the area that it's in for like what bee. Um, pollinates it so I know like almonds are like like it's mainly like honeybees that pollinate those but like fruits like apples and like blueberries and like different like other kinds of plants that are essential for like you know for other animals eating them um, those are mostly solitary bees and in like our community and in Colorado um, there's a lot of solitary bees. So we also had another question in here um, from somebody wanting to know is it worthwhile for people in other parts of the country to build bee hotels? So say the Northeast, for instance, or the West Coast? Um, well, I believe the statistic is that 90% um, of all bees are solitary. And I think that's um, nationwide, not just in Colorado. So um, I, I would say definitely. Um, I think it would it would be very beneficial to do some more research in your area specifically. Um, I know when we were doing our project, it was very hard to find um, area specific research, but um, 
it, it is interesting. Like, um, like Carly was saying, it depends on, it depends on where you live and the type of plants and crops in your area. Um, for example, we have, we have some orchards and some like local farms nearby and mason bees are particularly, um, attracted to those. But, um, but then when you look at, um, your, your gardens and your backyard, you're going to see more leaf cutter bees. Um, so it really, it really just depends what type of, um, what type of plants you have around. Very helpful. Thank you, Mackenzie and Carly. Um, so we are getting a lot of good comments in the chat here. And then also from the Q and A um, for Anna Lee. So wondering if making this film has influenced your thinking on food deserts and urban gardening. Um, and what are you planning to do next? Making this, it definitely opened my eyes to this idea of food deserts or what's known also as food apartheid. And it's an issue that I really didn't know existed. Um, and a lot of people who worked on, on the film as well with me also didn't know that this issue existed. So one, just, just educating on the fact that this is a problem in um, a lot of neighborhoods across the country and not even in just urban cities, the lack of access to healthy and sustainable food options. Um, and also just coming to the conclusion that having or um, the, the lack of access to healthy food options has a really holistic effect on a person because if you don't have healthy food, then that can have a negative impact on someone's physical health and if it has some and if it affects someone's physical health that could affect someone's ability to be able to concentrate in school or um, illnesses can come about that affects someone's ability to work which affects income and so it's a very uh, snowball effect that is not positive and so um, just becoming more aware of 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 what this issue is um and for what's next um in terms of filmmaking that's a wonderful question uh to be determined um i have some ideas in mind but they're a little bit different than food than food deserts but ultimately hopefully showcasing issues that are often overlooked thank you so much annalee i think yeah, your film really gets to the idea of food equity as dignity, um, which is, again, something that Food and Water Watch is working on and something that just comes across so powerfully in your film. Um, for Ilan, I'm wondering, what does environmental justice mean to you? And what do you wish that more people um, knew about environmental justice in the conversations that take place now in the media? Yeah, well, when it comes to environmental justice, there are certain communities, especially those that are marginalized, uh, that face environmental issues to a greater extent than others, uh, whether it be from pollution or contamination or anything of the sort. And you know, environmental justice means means bringing awareness to these issues uh, locally or or uh, you know their or their audience and to mobilize the community to change. You know, uh, while I was doing working on my film, I realized the, the, the great importance of the built environment and how that affects environmental justice. So when uh, communities are being built, the environment, of course, needs to be taken into account. And so uh, I just, I hope that, you know, something, things like my film can, can bring awareness so that more people can be mobilized to you know, make the world a better place. Yeah, definitely. And, and on that note, I know you are hoping that students see your film, of course, but that you also have hopes for members of Congress to see your film. And I'm wondering what you hope will come from um, a bigger audience for this film. Yeah, I mean, the, the ideal goal would just be to see, you know, big policy changes coming. If someone like a congressman were to see this, then of course, it's, you know, it's bringing awareness to an issue that most do not know about. And it's just, it's adding to the pool of environmental justice issues that have been occurring for so long. So if we are to make actual change, it would, it would be, you know, through policies, which would be through the congressman. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, we are getting more questions in the chat. So I will go back to, um, let's go back to Anna Lee. So I think everybody would like to know about um, how the characters in your film are doing. So the people who work at the food pantry, people who work at Just Roots, can you give us an update on them? Absolutely. If any of you find yourself in, in Chicago, come visit the farm. It's so beautiful. It's on 26th and State. Um, and it is flourishing. It is so beautiful. And really, really exciting is that they recently broke ground on a second farm in Sauk Village, which is a suburb just outside of Chicago on, on the south side. And that is going to be three acres. And the hope for that farm is to promote racial healing throughout, throughout the community. So that's super exciting and something to come for 2022 for them. All of the Just Roots people you saw in, in the film, they're, they're doing great and they're excited that, that they had a successful growing year. They grew 10,300 pounds of produce this past season, which is really exciting. Um, and as, as for Kathy, since the film, she moved when I was filming her and she has her rugged kitchen. She's in an apartment and she recently moved to her own house, which is really exciting. Um, and so she has more room for, she had many plants in her house. So she has a lot, a lot more room for, for that. Um, so everyone is doing really great. And if you find yourself in Chicago, definitely go visit. It's really fun. Oh my gosh, I absolutely will. Thank you, Annalie. Um, first of all, yeah, I love Chicago and I will absolutely go back and visit. Um, and that's wonderful that Kathy has her own home now. So, all right, looking back in the Q&A. Um, so the music for um, the Solitary Bee film was original, or at least mostly original. And we have a question in here um, from Lisa asking Carly, how long did it take to write and perform the soundtrack for your film? I just loved the, the flute music, so perfect for bees. Yeah, so the film music, um, it didn't take um, as long as I thought it would actually. It was pretty, it was a pretty like quick process. I had part of the um, score written already for a different project, but I think like the most time consuming part was definitely like recording just because it like, I did it on my computer and then like I listened back to it and it just like sounded different digitally. And then when I actually played it in person, I was like, like whoa, this sounds completely different. And we would have to record in different sections so um, I just had like an expectation for how I wanted it to sound. So there was kind of like a lot of like re-recording and like adding different parts and like adding harmony so it sounded fuller. So, and I think like the second half of the score, I redid it like right before we like submitted it. I was like, wait, can you can we re redo that? I wanna, you know, add something else in there. But yeah, it did, I guess it did take a while, but it was a fun process. No, that definitely makes sense. And the score is amazing. And it is just perfect for your subject. So I would Thank imagine you. that was a really fun process. Um, so another question from the chat for Ilan. Um, are there other environmental justice issues that have piqued your interest that maybe this film um, could be like a jumping off point for? Uh, well, I actually did come across one issue uh, that has to do with uh, the poor neighborhoods in LA uh, have uh, being the recipients of most of the contamination from factories. And that, that's an issue I came across while I was doing uh, my research for, for this film. So that's definitely something that I would be interested in making a um, another film on. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Um, there are a lot of environmental justice issues in LA, so I can't wait to see what you do. Um, everybody in the Q&A box wants to know what you're doing now and what your plans are for the future, and if you all have any future plans for films. So um, I think we've already heard from Ilan and Anna Lee. So Mackenzie and Carly, um, are you planning on any future collaborations? Um, I think we are recently talking about, um, we will both be home back in uh, Canyon City for the summer and we really want to um, 
make a similar project or at least start a similar project. Um, I'm studying uh, film right now at the University of Denver. And then Carly, you can say what you're <laughs> doing. And I'm at um, Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction and I'm studying biology and I'm doing a minor in music and hopefully I can get some composition classes in the next couple of years so I can keep re recording or performing and writing music for um, films. So what you're saying is that we can look forward to more films with your music, more collaborations. Yes. Hopefully, I'm really looking forward to this summer. Hopefully we can do something. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Again, I can't wait to see what you do. So, all right, we've got more questions in the Q&A. Um, a quick question for Anna Lee um, from Deborah. So how, how is the farm food financed at um, Just Roots? So Just Roots is a nonprofit. Um, so through donations and they have a lot of volunteers that that come in and help the the operation and uh, do daily life at the farm. All right, thank you very much. All right, so all of your films touch on problems that are happening on a global scale. And I know this can make them feel a bit overwhelming um, and insurmountable sometimes but you found ways to make a difference on these issues in your own communities. So what advice would you give to others looking to make a positive impact in their communities? And anybody can tackle this um, if anybody wants to just jump in. All right, I picked on Ilan last time. Let's go with Anna Lee. <laughs> um, one thing that I have discovered um, throughout this filmmaking process is that advocacy doesn't have to look a certain way. And I feel like a, a lot of the times that we might see advocacy look a certain way, especially on like social media and um, the news. Um, but I think it's a matter of tapping into each of our individual um, gifts and talents and in and interests and and running with that. And so I really enjoy filmmaking. And so that's my chosen form of ad of of main ad advocacy um and so it doesn't have to be something that's super uncomfortable or a topic that um you're maybe not super familiar with of course if, if you're interested then do do the digging but um you know finding what in what interests you and using the gifts to make the ad make the advocacy unique to you thanks Annalie. Um, Mackenzie, Carly, do you have any anything else to add on how people can make a positive impact in their own community? I was just going to say, um, just start small and like focus on what you can actually do. So like for us, like the bees, like it's such a big problem. We're like, well, we can make bee hotels in our backyards and maybe that will do something to help, you know, the situation. Start small is definitely good advice. Elon, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I think, you know, what's been said has been amazing, but I would just add that, you know, um, anything anyone can do is uh, productive and, you know, whether it be the smallest thing, it, it always helps. So just do that. Yeah, something is always better than nothing. Um, so another question for all, all of you really, um, how can others help lift up the voices of young people like you? Because I know um, you are the ones whose voices will really raise all of these issues and make a difference. So what can all of us do to support you and uplift your voices? I, um, what comes to mind first is just, um, maybe this is just personal for me, but sitting down and, and having a conversation and, and um, not just hearing what we're saying, but really listening and, and, and digesting because, um, you know, like we all have different life experiences and um, especially these days, things are changing so fast, especially with tech technology. And so um, sitting down with whoever that person is 
in your life and listening to them and um, and based on what what they're saying, you know, like, um, sorry, I'm stumbling all over my words, but I'm sure that everyone um, wants to be heard and seen in in different ways. And so being aware of what those different ways are because um, we all want to be seen and heard. No, I think that's fantastic. And I think you summed it up so well, just listen. I think we can all be better at listening. Um, so I think we can, we can wrap it up there unless anyone has anything else to add. Um, I'm so grateful to be a part of this um, discussion that we've had. I'm so inspired by all of you, your creativity and your talent and the way that you've used the medium of film to tell these incredible stories. And I know we all look forward to seeing more of your work. Um, so thank you all so much for being here tonight. And I will now turn things back over to Kate, um, who has a few final announcements. All right. Yes. Thank you so much um, to um, everyone for joining us um, for this incredible conversation. Um, really loved hearing um, from all of you um, about your films and, and what drew you to those topics. I think that's so important. Um, they're so important topics for everybody to, to learn more about um, and get more engaged in. Um, so, um, and again, thank you to One Earth um, Young Filmmakers Contest for helping us bring this screening to life. And I do have a few final announcements before we close out um, this um, screening and before those of you who received the invitation to the post-screening small group discussion, hop on over to your second Zoom link. Um, so first um, announcement is that earlier this fall, Food and Water Watch hosted our very first virtual conference. And we had 12 sessions throughout the day and we covered topics like environmental justice, voting rights, our fight to ban factory farms, the path to ending fossil fuel use, um, as well as a number of hands-on trainings um, for things like effective storytelling, which we heard a little bit about tonight, um, and how to meet with an elected official. So for a small donation, all of those recordings are available online through the end of the year, along with four special bonus content sessions. Um, these are just tons of great resources for anyone who enjoys our monthly event series or who is looking to learn or develop a new skill. Um, and your donation um, to access these supports the work that our organizers are doing on the ground in communities across the US. Um, we'll put a link in the chat for you to access those if you're interested. Um, and I'll also share that the access includes being able to watch um, our amazing keynote speech from Amy Goodman, who is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now!, um, as well as our annual benefit, which had tons of special guest speakers, including Mark Ruffalo, um, a musician named Max Frost, um, and many of our allies in Congress. So again, if you're interested in accessing all of that great content, you can um, visit the link that was just shared in the chat. Um, I will also ask uh, that everyone please take our event survey. Um, we really value your feedback and it helps us shape this event series so that we can bring the topics to you that you're most interested in hearing about. And everyone who fills out the survey will be entered into a drawing to win a Food and Water Watch bandana. You can see um, one of our New York organizers, um, Santosh, who many of you might know, um, modeling that in the, the picture on the screen here. So we'll put a link to that survey in the chat um, and I'll also send it out over email. Um, and so finally, I hope that you will all join us next month on December 8th for our next event where we're talking about some critical fights against um, a couple of dangerous power plants that are threatening local communities in New York, New Jersey, Calif and California specifically, um, and what we can do about it. Um, so you can sign up for that in our January event um, at the link that you see here on the screen. Um, and so um, that um, concludes the end of the screening now. So thank you all so much for being here with us and I hope you have a great evening. 
Um, and for those of you who did receive that invitation for the post um, screening small group conversation, please rejoin us on the second Zoom link that you received in your email earlier this afternoon or that I texted you earlier this afternoon. So go ahead and um, hop on over to that second room um, and I'll see you all there shortly. Um, and thanks again to everyone else who joined us this evening. I hope that you all have a wonderful evening.